Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming, and thanks for watching at home our Brick Media Talks. The documentary is a marathon producing nonfiction projects here at Brick. Brick is the leading presenter of free cultural programming in Brooklyn and one of the largest in New York City. We present and incubate works by artists and media makers who reflect the diversity that surrounds us. Brick's programs reach hundreds of thousands of people each year. Brick Media Talks feature professional television producers, directors, documentary filmmakers, video editors, and new media producers sharing their perspectives and stories with the community. These discussions are held throughout the borough and air on our Brooklyn Free Speech Media channels. Media Talks are always free and open to the public. So tonight's media talk was inspired by a conversation or conversations with participants of our 2018 Brick Documentary Intensive, which is a, a program that we do where folks develop their first documentary. And after the thrill of making your first documentary wears off, finding ways to keep momentum and sustain energy is a real challenge because most people have bills to pay and jobs to go to and some people have kids and it doesn't even t take into account the lives of documentary subjects. So I wanted to get a group of media makers together who work in the field and who make their own media and make their own projects both professionally and, and outside of maybe their jobs in the media world to talk about how they balance all this stuff. So we have three amazing panelists for here tonight and I'd like you to please welcome Martine Gramby, Eleanor Kagan, and Caitlin May Burke. <laughs> Yay! Hi. 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 Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. All right. I'm going to uh, start by reading all your bios. I hope that's okay. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay, cool. This is going to take a minute, so please bear with me. Martine Granby is a visual storyteller. She's currently a producer with the Brooklyn-based Brick TV, where she's co-produced and directed the Emmy-winning Be Heard documentary series. Be Heard Town Halls, and the weekly magazine show Going In with Brian Vines. As a fellow with Carter Quinn Film, Diverse Voices, and Doc Programs, she started production on her current film, The Mask That Grins and Lies. The Mask That Grins and Lies is a meditative feature-length documentary film addressing the invisibility of black women's mental illness and the stigma that silences a community. She's a graduate of Northwestern's Medal School of Journalism? Medill, Med Medill. Medill. sorry, I should have checked with you. Okay. Martine, thank you for being here. Um, you can clap. You can clap. <laughs> we're a fun. We're a fun group. <laughs> Eleanor Kagan in the center here strives to build communities with her work, whether it be through podcasts, innovative audio, or live events. Prior to joining Pineapple Street Media in 2018 as a senior producer, she served as Bud BuzzFeed's director of audio and spearheaded several critically acclaimed podcasts, including Another Round, See Something, Say Something, and The Thirst Aid Kit. She's produced more than 100 live events in three countries and has been on staff at NPR's Ask Me Another, NPR Music, and WFUV. Her latest series, Julie, The Unwinding of the Miracle, explores the process of dying. Hi, Eleanor. Hi. How are you? <laughs> it's so much Hi. stuff to, to read. Too much stuff. Woo. Um, I'm going to not talk after this. Um, <laughs> Caitlin May Burke is an Emmy-winning producer. Documentary features she produced have screened and won awards at Sundance, Berlinale, Tribeca, True False, Bam Cinema Fest, MoMA, the Museum of the Moving Image, and in movie theaters internationally. Caitlin's work as a producer and director has been broadcast on ABC, CNBC, Discovery Networks, ESPN, Field of Vision, own TLC and YouTube Red. She's an alumna of Berlin Alley Talents, an inaugural indu inductee into Doc NYC's 40 Under 40, and is currently the program manager for Tribeca Film Institute's If Then Shorts, which funds short documentary films. Hi, Caitlin. Hi. Wow, what an amazing. I feel like we're done. That was so good. <laughs> That's good. Um, good, good so we're going to, good to have you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we're going to watch some clips to start of work that you all have done. And we're going to go right down the line and introduce that. We're going to reduce, we're going to have them introduce all three clips and then we're going to watch all three clips and then we're going to talk uh, a little bit about making those films and some of the challenges. So we're going to have Martine first introduce um, The Mask That Grins and Lies. Eleanor is going to introduce Julie and then Caitlin is going to introduce Obit. Martine. Liam. Hi. Hi. Do you want to talk about The Mask That Grins and Lies? Sure. Just um, tell us a little bit about, little bit about what it. we're going to see and what it is. Yep. Uh, so it's my first feature length documentary um, about um, black women and mental illness. Um, and it's basically now about my family and the history of silence around that. Um, and uh, so I'm in, we'll get to all the, the things and the nuts and bolts about it. But um, what you're about to see is a clip um, with me and my grandmother and um, some telling moments. Cool. Yeah. Eleanor, do you want to talk a little bit about Julie? 
You know, I was thinking about this, and I kind of, uh, I think the 30-second clip you're going to play mm -hmm. is something I'm curious for people to just experience cold. Okay. And then I can talk Damn about it. Damn it, Eleanor. Yeah. So withholding. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, that's totally fine. Okay. That's totally fine. Cool. Caitlin, how do you follow that up? Are you going to, oh. you want to tell us anything well, about Obit? I think um, I'm excited to talk about Obit mm -hmm. after people see the teaser. Obit is a feature documentary about the obituary department at the New York Times that premiered in 2016 at Tribeca and then did theatrical internationally after that. Um, and all of that sounds great. And so I want to talk about what it was actually cool. like with that movie after okay. you see it. Cool. Let's roll these clips, please. I'm here, honey. I'm Hi, here. I'm really happy you're here. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy too. The problem with um, my family, they don't have the same coping mechanisms that I do. What are yours? <laughs> I don't know, but whatever it is, it, they work. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I guess prayer basically for the ones who are um, injured psychologically and the ones who are doing the injury I'm just blessed that I was never in that position which position being the one that um, that was injured psychologically. And you would think that I would be because of the law to my father at seven. Yeah, what happened there? My mother killed him. You were in the house, right? We were all in the house. It was three o'clock in the morning. But after 15 years of brutalizing her, she couldn't take it anymore. If you knew that you were dying, how would you prepare for that moment? This room I designed planning to die here. The, the wallpaper, which is on one wall only, it's an accent wall, it's gold. It was expensive, but I splurged because I said, you know what, the people are going to come visit me as I'm dying, I want to have a nice background. <laughs> Julie, The Unwinding of the Miracle, is a new podcast series that captures the conversations one woman has with the people she loves as she prepares for her death. There aren't too many of us doing this anymore. I mean, you could count them on one hand. I got a few. Ms. Miller, it's Bruce Weber at the New York Times. We would like to uh, run an obituary of your husband. People often ask, oh, you're an obit writer. Isn't it depressing? I was leaning away from doing it. Yeah, now I'm leaning yeah. toward doing it. Are you? Yeah. It's kind of a tacit commentary on this old but still prevalent Victorian sensibility that obits have to be demure, respectful, lacrimous, God knows not funny. Hello there. It's counterintuitive, ironic even, but obits have next to nothing to do with death, and in fact, absolutely everything to do with the life. If you have a chance that you can't repeat, it's a once only chance to make the dead live again. Um, 
That is such an amazing cross-section of work. I don't really know how we start to talk about it, but let's try. So I feel like the first thing that I noticed was that, so Obit's now finished and very, uh, very finished. Very finished. And Julie's also pretty finished. Yep, it's out in the world. It's and out I in guess the world. The one thing I maybe should have said to set it up is it's a podcast series, not, right. a, not a film. Yeah, <laughs> which you all gather. It's a I'm podcast. Sure. <laughs> cool. Um, and The Mask That Grins and Lies is, is, do you want to tell us a little bit about where you are with it now that sure. we've seen it yeah so um i'm in i would say early production with it uh, i started out making a film about myself and not putting myself in it um it was started out about three years ago um and i had two uh other women in it and i wanted to kind of talk about mental illness in the black community specific specifically to black women because it's something i hadn't seen and something that obviously runs in my family and um there just wasn't a portrayal of that that some that rang true mm -hmm. to me um, so I reached out to these two other women um, that I had never known and uh, kind of started following their stories. And then as I was going around pitching the film and trying to get funding and everything, everyone's like, well, why are you the filmmaker to make it right? That's always the question you get. And then in telling kind of bits and pieces of my story, they're like, oh, that's that's really interesting. I was like, no, I'm not. There's nothing here. <laughs> Don't. It's, it's them. It's not me. And then um, I, I did a, a fellowship or workshop um, this past summer at Union Docs and kind of delved into the narrative and found out that it was really, yeah, it was, it was about, about you. me and my family. And then there was enough there that um, I could stop pretending that, you know, I didn't, I, I couldn't put myself in it or, you know, how daunting that is and your family. And actually my family has been really kind of wonderful about mm -hmm. um, access and how much it's kind of cathartic for them, cathartic for them as well. Um, so yeah, it's in the last, I'd say about like six months or so I've been filming a lot with my family and, Going down. Where's your family? family? So they're everywhere. They're um, my my folks. Uh, my brother and my sister are all in New York. My my parents live in Westchester, New York, and my sister actually lives here in Crown Heights. And um, my grandmother, who you saw on the film, is in North Carolina and Virginia. So we're kind of between the rural and the the city a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um. So, Eleanor, do you want to talk a little bit about? With the with Julie, kind of, although it's not personal in this way, you're dealing with someone at a really, the most personal moment of their life. So, like, how did how did that work, and how did you go about working with the Julie, the subject, to yeah. to make that <clears throat> happen? Um, so, I guess by way of explanation, um, Julie is a four episode podcast series um, that follows a woman sort of through the last nine months of her life uh, as she is dying of stage four colon cancer at the age of forty two. And the reason the project came about was because um, she wrote this blog throughout the five years of her illness where she wanted to sort of give voice to all the things that she was thinking and feeling that you she felt like she didn't see out there, kind of like the unsexy parts and like the the un rah rah parts mm -hmm. and like the parts where she's really scared and she's bitter and she's, you know, talking with her husband about the concept of him getting married like after she dies sort of all of these things that she didn't felt like she saw explored in a really honest way so she wrote this blog it becomes a memoir um that's coming out and then uh they wanted to do a podcast series to go along with the with the memoir and so uh that's how i got involved and so i spent about two months um recording with her and i think the idea was that we were going to record with her for the last few months of her life. And everyone thought that she was going to live a little bit longer, but she died very quickly into my involvement in it. So I had a series of recordings, um, but a lot of the tape of the show are conversations that she had with her editor, who's also her good friend of her book mm -hmm. um, as they were planning the book um, as she was sort of, making plans for what she wanted her death to be like and what she wanted um, for her children and her family after she died. And she was, you know, a very uh, meticulous planner. And so she had a lot of ideas and she had a lot of ideas about both the book and the podcast. Um, That's kind of cool. It was, it was great because yeah. When you are helping facilitate somebody's story, that's not your own, especially someone who's not going to live to see it. Um, it's an incredible amount of responsibility. And so having Julie say what her wishes were and sort of be um, uh, sort of the guide of how she wanted to tell her story 
was a good roadmap for us. Um, and so I spent sort of the next year working with um, audio uh, interviews that I had recorded, that her editor Mark had recorded, that her family had recorded, and then a couple of my fellow producers had recorded before I started working on the project full time. Um, so it was a lot of different types of tape and we tried to figure out how to tell the story with that. So you had a lot of material and then you had to kind of back into the narrative to yeah. figure out how the narrative would work. And and like Martine, I didn't want to be in the story at all because it's not my mm -hmm. story to tell. Um, but one of the challenges with audio is uh, you as the narrator, your voice is in a lot of way the B-roll. Mm -hmm. um, you're telling people what they're seeing, what, uh, you know, what the scene is. And so I feel like I'm in there enough to like let you know what's happening but then i get out of the way and julie tells her story mm. hopefully cool um before just in terms of thinking about that and i think this, this is a good question to open up to everyone but, um and caitlin i want to hear a little bit about obit but in, in terms of thinking about how you're you're on this very strange timetable when you're doing with this dealing with a subject who's ill or she's got a terminal illness so how do you figure out when to talk about what like how do you f prioritize and figure this kind of stuff out i mean in in terms of talking about her death yeah well that was one of the things that was special about julie was that she was super down to talk about all of this all the time wow. um she was so comfortable talking about it her whole thing was like i want to normalize conversations about death mm -hmm. um because it's something that a lot of us are really afraid of and we don't talk about, but I'm just going to like talk about it and be super blunt and tell you what I'm thinking and feeling. Um, and so the first time I met her, I was kind of like, oh, do I bring this up? I'm not sure. Um, but it was just a question of how are you feeling? How mm -hmm. was your day? And she's like, oh, I had this scan. Like, here's what's going on. Here's what I'm pissed about. Like real life stuff. She, kind of. she was super open and ready to talk about all of it. So it made it okay to go there with her cool that's wow. a, that's an interesting access question though because obviously this is like this is something that is incredibly serious and like very much all of our worst fears but you're talking about people where you can assume that they can withdraw consent and then your project uh, takes a very different direction mm -hmm. and so i think that that's a question that we've all had to face in terms of like when you ask what questions and knowing that some of the harder ones might just like pull the rug out from the entire thing because someone can stop returning your calls right and like some of that i've i've thought a lot about access building because i like ex almost exclusively produce and it's something that i've thought about in terms of like what of my own work i show when i'm trying to get in a door um that like you know, if I want to film a refugee soccer camp in a church, then I'm going to show them the blind senior swimmer who mm -hmm. is, like, really inspirational and not the, like, experimental film about the Church of Satan. Like, it's just – but I think that there are questions that are like that, too, when you're talking to someone and if you know something is – or you perceive it to be, like, the crux of the film, sort of when you introduce that into the conversation is really important. And if it's – you know, there's always a scary thing that you're going to lose that opportunity, but also if it comes too early, then you don't get to ask all of the other questions either. Right. So it's sort of about, like, it's again, a, a question of balance and knowing like what's appropriate at a given time with, with folks, I feel like is a way to think about it maybe. I'm not sure. Um, Caitlin, speaking a little bit about Obit, like watching in terms of the, I feel like the thing that spoke to me the most in, in the trailer is the fact that it's it's about a, not a newsroom per se, but it, but it is kind of about that it's kind of newsroom, culture yeah. and the way that they do things. And like, I feel like that world is very hard to access and get mm -hmm. into. So how as mm -hmm. a producer do you manage that? Um, Vanessa Gould, who directed Obit, is a genius. And I have to say that every <laughs> time I talk about the movie, um, and I have a lot of other things to say about, like, that movie looks shiny. It looks like a million bucks, and it was an a, a straight nightmare to make. And we made it in a, like, in a storage unit on top of a garbage dump in Red Hook. And I, like... Wait, in, what? Yeah. So, like, that movie looks really great. Mm -hmm. and it looks like it's, like, super fully funded and that... Yeah, it looks like amazing. A, a breeze. And when, when I... The director cold emailed me. Um, so I took the meeting and I was like, oh, yeah, all of the documentaries I've made up until this point were like artistic and hard. This will be super easy to raise money for. Everyone wants to see a movie about the New York Times. And like 
and in post production on this movie, I made a pizza last for like a week and a half because I I took another job in the middle of the movie to like survive to get to the end. Um, How long did this film take? I were I think for around five years, but I worked on the last two and a half. So wow. yeah, that's yeah, that might be an exaggeration, but um, from like concept to uh, theatrical, probably that's accurate Mm -hmm. um but in terms of access the new york times had been burned before by another film that i won't name but there are only two films about the new york times that aren't bill cunningham um (laughs) and that was something where they kind of like they were they run amok in the newsroom and it was Mm -hmm. they just really and they are they're the new york times they don't have to give anyone access right and they have a trillion very high-powered lawyers so vanessa came in with this like surgical plan Wow. And she said, I won't film anything that's not on this plan. And I'm going to shoot in five days. And then I'm going to have interviews on these days mm-hmm. and like full. And so every writer had to give their own in like had to consent as well. Right. But it was something where the time she had just done such a good job, really outlining exactly what it was that she wanted to do. Another thing is that like we didn't take the access for granted. If you see like the font of the newspaper is something we paid for that like every uh, part of this is like also very like very meticulously arranged with them mm-hmm. which i think was really necessary for the access because they felt very in control and they felt and the reason they should always feel in control because they have incredibly high powered lawyers and the right. moment you step out of line the movie dies but the other important thing for us is that we didn't make it with any financial support from the times the only thing that they got to do was that they got to do a legal review but they didn't have to promote it they didn't have to they did not give us a cent that we gave them a lot of money to be mm. able to use the footage and i think that that's sort of a safeguard for them to um in terms of the relationship because it was all so negotiated mm-hmm. and because we like we didn't stay five minutes beyond when we said we were going to be in there because it is an active newsroom and it is something where obits are a little bit different than the other newsroom but they're all on deadline and right. so like if you see the film you can see their their irritation and frustration <laughs> is that they're approaching their deadline and also that vanessa is asking them a question in the moments where they have 20 minutes before it goes to press right um but yeah, I think that that preparation on her part and the facts that we were so like we didn't bring in an, any equipment that we hadn't mm-hmm. cleared, and so I think that just like that's something that I like to bring to every production, even if I'm just hanging out in someone's house, because they deserve the same level of respect as the New York Times, even if they don't have a lawyer. Right. And that's something that I think everyone should be considering in their access building, which is like don't take advantage of people just because you aren't afraid of them, because they deserve that respect even more because they don't have that empowerment. Right. So it's like it, you're treating everyone in the same way because you're you're wanting to make sure that, that this, the treatment is across the board the yeah. same and stuff like that. So with kind of with that in mind, when you're dealing with, let's say, familial tension or you're dealing with someone who's terminally ill or you're dealing with a major company, inevitably, whenever you're making a documentary, and I, I ask this because I'm meeting with our documentary students right now, and they're all in that phase where I sit down with them, and I'm like, how's it going? And they're like, it's terrible. Everything's terrible. The movie's falling apart. I hate it. Um, and I like they, they're sort of in this difficult position where maybe subjects are non-communicative. They're scrambling. They're rewriting. They're figuring out what the story is. How do you deal with that stuff? <laughs> so I have some general questions, and that's one of them. I, I can't say the word before 11 p.m. on Access TV, public Access TV, but I yeah, will you say in the <laughs> SHIT is is that's the expression know. that we use. But yeah. um, I mean, I'll talk about where I am now. Um, I mean, I thought this film was dead in the water several times because of Access, because it's just not a light subject that you enter into, and is like, um, you know, Caitlin said it's you have to give everyone that respect and really you treat everyone like, okay, you're, you're, you're negotiating every single time. This level of trust is, mm-hmm. is kind of the, the first and foremost thing you do with every subject. And every time you're renegotiating that because you're a stranger, you're coming into their home, you're asking them these really intimate questions. You're asking them to divulge so much and they're not honestly getting anything out of it other than 
this work that you're creating for them. Um, and so even with my family, I, I tiptoe around it. I definitely wear the hat of like, I'm the daughter, but I'm also the producer director. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm checking in every second and, and never taking for granted that this is, um, that like this, th I know this person, but I also like know what the work I'm asking. And then the moments where you feel like you are, um, the film is falling apart. I mean, I think I can speak for all of us that, that you always feel like that. You never feel like you have a handle <laughs> yeah. on it's the film. Point. If nope. you feel like you have a handle on the film, you should stop making it because you're not trying hard enough. You know what I mean? You're not getting to that, like, the heart of the film. Um, Interesting. You mean, like, it's you're not maybe not going deep enough? You're not or, going, okay. yeah, not trying. I mean, like, yeah, I you're, just not, yeah. you're not getting to the thing that you're, you're really trying to go after because it's it's hard. It's not, uh, like, nobody, if, if it was easy, everyone would do it, right? But um, the one thing that always kind of keeps me grounded is I remember what brought me to this project in the first place. Like, what's the one thing that drew me to make this in the first place? And I have to remind myself, okay, so it's, like, seeing myself or, still, like, having that, for someone else being able to see themselves on screen mm -hmm. in these really hard moments um, that will mean something. Um, even in the moment, I'm like, I don't care anymore. I don't care I'm in the, anymore. like in the fetal position in the bathroom. <laughs> like, it's over. I don't care. Um, but you know, you have fetal to kind position. of, Got yeah, it. a lot yeah. of fetal position moments, a lot of like watching silly shows <laughs> on Netflix right. to get you through it. Um, but you have to just remember those moments of like what, what brought you to this. And, um, and then also, even now that's my family, but even when I was working with um, two other folks that I didn't, you know, know in that way, um, I also made a promise to them mm -hmm. to continue this piece. And so as hard as this is, we're just going to like trudge through and figure it out. How much more time do you think you have in terms of production? Okay, moving on. <laughs> Why would you ask that? The, uh, no, because I'm, I so mean, I'm, I'm literally you know, asking questions about I, documentary yeah, right uh, now. It's a fun question that I'm sure every filmmaker loves to answer. I mean, you have to answer that. I'm in for, trouble. I'm in for trouble. funding and when you're pitching, right? They they kind of want to know like when's it, yeah. day, when's it coming out, and you know, you usually just give them some kind of. I hope they don't watch this because yeah. like, I'm not lying we'll to you. Cut but this part uh, out. No, I mean, I think it's a verite film, right? So it's like life as an own folds and there's a lot of recounting as well so there's a lot of like archival footage and things like that um and so i don't know maybe like the end of next year but if mm. if i feel like there's still more to be pulled out i mean it's just like caitlin said there's these moments where you want to kind of you know where you want to go end of next year sounds very reasonable okay well yeah so i say that's this good. now but yeah that's true <laughs> Um, anything to add in terms of what you do when you're in that crisis moment, that crisis point? I mean, I feel like you so nailed so much, and I agree with so much of what you said, um, is that everyone goes through it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I went through a, f a very long period where I had no idea how this series was actually going to be in the world. Like, I couldn't see a path. Mm -hmm. I was in, like, the forest. Uh, I use the metaphor a lot of, like, I feel like I'm in the forest the forest and uh, I have a butter knife as a machete and I'm trying to like whack my way through it and I couldn't. Very blunt instrument. Yeah, not sharp at all. Um, and I like didn't see a way that this these hours and hours of tapes would become a story that you mm -hmm. could listen to. Um, Cause like I knew the emotion was there and I knew that there was tape that I would listen to and like cry in the office with my fellow producers. Um, but I was like, how do I fashion this into a story that you can follow that gives you a sense of who this woman is and what she wants, um, but is also something that you want to listen to. Right. Like, I think what what we really tried to do, and I think what Julie really tried to do with her book was, yes, the story is about death, but in many ways, in the way that Obed is about life, like Julie's story is about life, and it's very hopeful mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways. And so we just tried to lean into that without getting maudlin, um, yeah, that's my impression listening to it. I didn't feel super... I, I sort of held off because I was like, uh, but then I listened yeah. to it and I didn't feel depressed. I'm really glad yeah, to I felt hear good. that. Um, but to go back to your question, I think the thing that got me through um, and my team through were two things. One, I felt like we owed it to Julie to deliver her story to the world the best mm -hmm. we could. Like, I wanted to do right by her because this is what she really wanted. Um and secondly, I mean, I did not make this alone. I had two amazing producers, mm -hmm. Jess Hackle and Megan Tan, and uh, my editor, Joel Lovell, and um, our executives at Pineapple Street. And when I, I guess I got used to being really, to pushing myself to being vulnerable and admitting that I was having a hard time and saying, like, I don't know how we're going to get through this. <laughs> we're on draft 25 of the first episode. Oof. Um, we've restructured it 
that many times, like I'm having a hard time here. And uh, at one point, my editor Joel was like, "Yeah, yeah, it's always like this. Like yeah. any podcast series you listen to has gone through something like, like this, yeah. where it's it's hard. This is this is the work. Is it also hard to kind of use kind of you have to be sort of clinical in terms of going like, what's the story? What's the structure? You're dealing with like this really difficult yeah. real life stuff, but at a certain point, you have to be like, okay, this tape is good or this tape is bad. Like, how do you how do you kind of figure out? that balance between thinking about how you feel listening to it and how you use it to tell a story. I remember the tapes that made me cry in the office. And mm -hmm. I was like, that stuff goes in. And when I've listened to it 50 times and stopped making me cry anymore, I'm still going to remember what my initial emotional response was. Yeah. And that's something. So you can kind of recall that stuff. Yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah, it was hard. Glad, For sure. Glad we finished. That's it. why we're here. To <laughs> talk about it being hard. Caitlin. Yes. Um, thinking about, do you have like, was there a moment on Obit where it was like, <sighs> everything exploded? Was there multiple moments on Obit where it felt like everything was going to explode? Yes. Endlessly. <laughs> Tell me about no one, one wanted to give us any money. Um, I mean, I, I, my, I think this is, so Obit is my fifth feature and I'm on 10 now, so it's like right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it did, it's had a nice life. Um, there were a lot of, I mean, I think the thing is like with any of them, all it is is that you have to stay in love with the project and stay in love with the people you're making it right. with. And that is a like incredible producer privilege that I get, I, it's not like, it's not on me to make it brilliant. It's on me to make sure that the person who's making it brilliant has snacks and, and like has what they need to be able to create. And so I actually am like the person in the catastrophe who has to, who cannot be the all is lost. Um, right. And like whether or not I actually think that's true, like whether or not I think that we're actually going to like have to, that it won't be a movie and we'll have wasted all of this time and money making it. Um, I mean, with Obit, it was really just that it was it was an ambitious and expensive project to do with, that really didn't get any support until the bitter, bitter end. Um, and so there wow. were a lot of things where like, we just turned the lights off or we asked for a lot of favors. Like I left for three months and took another job because we didn't have enough money. Um, I think they like, someone remortgaged their house. This is all like, this is all stuff that happens in the documentary. Right. Um, and to your point to Martine, when I like, I have been really lucky to work with a lot of like really early career or like first or second time directors once they figure out that having a producer is nice. And so when I'm making their budget and <laughs> they like lose their minds, I'm like, every documentary is gonna take five to seven years and three to $500,000. And then they panic about that because they thought that it would be like two years and done. Mm -hmm. Or that that's such a like, that is an unfathomable amount of money. Right. But it's also kind of freeing because it's not money that we have. And so it's not something where it's like, oh, well, I have to like, I just have to move into a smaller apartment and I'll be able to afford, afford my, my movie. For, right. <laughs> like it's just not possible. And so that's also like a terrifying gift that you can have is to just know like this is going to take some time and it's going to take resources outside of myself. Um, I mean, a lot of Obit, like, some of the Obit nightmares happened like when we were premiering. Um, that like been, when we were literally last minute, Vanessa, the director, was coming down the stairs to go like watch the final cut that we were going to play at the premiere, mm -hmm. and she fell down and broke both of her ankles. Oh, and so like, God. yeah. So wow, that's the kind of like, but real life we, stuff, right? That happens, and the movie. But no one else who's seen the movie on Amazon or wherever else it is, no one in the audience know knows that. that's true. They just saw a movie. Um, and I think that that's why film festivals exist, so that you can like drink to forget all of the like <laughs> stuff that you did. Write that I'm down, serious please. about this. Yeah. That's like a Snacks real reason and drink that, to like, forget. why anyone makes, and there's a lot of, I think that the analog to, to parenthood is like occasionally false and I can't really verify it because I don't have kids. But it's like, if no one remembered the like intimate details of the pain of childbirth, they would like, our species would die. Right. But you forget because you love your like squishy little baby, and that's how I've made nine movies. Because <laughs> every time it's like, no, this is gonna be great. I love this person. I love this idea. 
someone will, that's, oh, New York Times, tons of people are going to give us money to make that movie. It's going to be great. So it's kind of to speak to like what sounds like a little bit of as, as a producer or as a director or as a, in any capacity making things, you be, you're a little bit of a therapist because you're dealing with personalities that are very dedicated to either telling their story or telling a story. So what are some good techniques? I mean, in a way, you're sort of self-coping, I think, to some extent. But like, what, what are te- <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you are. What are sure. some things you, you do to kind of like, either for yourself or when you're working with people that are freaking out about the fact that making stuff is difficult and scary? I mean, for myself, I have a couple of uh, folks that are like producers and friends that mm-hmm. I kind of call upon and they're so lovely and other filmmaker friends that are generous with their time and um, energy and I just kind of <laughs> like whenever I need to like can I just tell you about how the film like you know what the best advice I got was at a film festival a couple of years ago I had, I had said the film is dead I was like it's over it's dead it's dead it's dead, it's dead. It's dead. and uh, and everyone was like oh okay and they like listened <laughs> to me and they were listening to it they were like you know what I don't think it's over but like you're allowed to quit your film at least once a week and that was just oh. such a freeing moment I was like oh so now I just say like once a week I'm like no it's done I'm done we're done and nobody bats an eye nobody gives me any crap about it they're just kind of okay and then like a day later I'm like okay, so we're gonna shoot this and then and it like doesn't and it's like you're back it you're me. back so that is just like kind of a <laughs> moment of like I quit my film done they and, quit and it. Then it's just, quit. The, it just gives me a little bit of because like I am have been on this journey for so long uh-huh. by myself and funding has been an issue even though everyone's like oh this film needs to be seen I'm like does it because like no one's giving me money for it um and to be fair the film has been in many iterations and and it wasn't ready to be funded um but uh I will say all that to say that that moment of just being able to just give yourself that freedom of being like, okay, you can, you can walk away from this and it's okay. It's not going to be in the world. You're not a terrible person. You can make another film. This is not the only thing you're going to make. So like giving yourself permission to, yeah. to be like, Pfft. yeah, wow. and then, of course, you know, you're going to get back on it, but right. you just give yourself a little bit of a break. But yeah. that's like, I feel like that's undervalued the ability to say like, I don't want to, because agree. everyone feels like they have to be doing stuff all the time. I agree. And I, and, you know, I have a full-time job. I work here at brick and a lot of the times I'm like, this is too much. This is too much. Yeah. Who's doing this? Who, who wants why to Why am do I this? doing this? Why am I doing this? The why is, and again, you have to go back to like the why right. of it all. So yeah. I, yeah, producer therapy. Um, both, I have a real therapist who I don't talk to about producing that much, but I have a friend who is, and what I love about her is that like, it's an exchange, but she ends every like upsetting, like nightmare thing with, just haha so it's like oh well you know all of the subjects decided they were going to go on a cruise for the one week that we like flew to iceland to film with them and also the equipment is being held by customs and i think i had food poisoning haha and so (laughs) and then i'm like like, oh well my executive producers just dropped out of this project and left us thirty five thousand dollars in the hole and also we like got our gear confiscated and the kids gonna it's like haha but i think that that's the like I have my designated person who lives in my phone, mm-hmm. um, who also lives in Brooklyn, and so this happens in real life. But it's nice to know sort of where the outlet is, and I also think that uh, the beauty—it's a beauty of film festivals, and it's also just a like Brick is doing this too, where it's creating a community of artists where you have the person who understands a little bit differently than your partner or your like lay people friends what you're going through, and they've they can either do the pissing contest of like, oh, this is like but this is how bad it is for me, but it's also just helpful to be like, and we came out on the other side of it, or I don't know what you're going through, but I have a similar experience. And so just having an artistic community and friends where you can mm-hmm. like eat a sandwich and worry together is I think a really helpful. Like group thing therapy. Have. Yeah. 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 The group text with fellow producers is very important. Mm. Um, which helps me immensely every day. Um, but I'll, I'll also add to what both of you have said, um, which is that uh, going through this project was, I think I, I dealt with my own level of imposter syndrome of like, why am oh. I the right person to make this? I don't know what I'm doing. Right. All of that stuff. Um, but at the same time, I had another podcast series that I was working on that was oh. a format of a show that I felt very comfortable with. It was storytelling interviews right. um 
And it was a type of show that I have produced shows like it before. So I felt very comfortable with like, I know how to make this show. Uh Um, So I would spend like part of the week working on Julie where I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then spend the other part of the week being like, I do know what I'm doing. Um, And being able to sort of go back and forth between those two projects, even though it was like, I was working on a lot of stuff. I was very busy. um, But it was, I think I work better when I'm, when I have like almost too much on my plate than not Mm. enough on my plate. Um, I think so too. I don't know what that's about. Me, I think I do too. (laughs) I think so too, Eleanor. What about you? Yeah. Um, But having a show that I felt comfortable in and a show that I felt, like less comfortable in um helped and that other show actually just came out on monday okay uh wow should all subscribe it's called going through it it also helped that it was a show that was literally stories of women who were going through very tough things in their lives wow so it all was of a piece i don't know yeah well i think that's interesting (laughs) because it's sort of like you used the metaphor earlier of like hacking through a forest with a butter knife (laughs) But then you had this other thing where you're hacking through the forest with like a very sharp machete because you know what it is. Like it's kind of like you know how to use that part of your brain in a certain way, but then you move to the other thing and you have to figure out what's going on with it a little bit. Like, does it help to have that kind of compartmentalization? I want to talk about compartmentalization yeah. I yeah. think, a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it helped me because I love new things and I love doing something that I've never totally done before in exactly that way, but mm-hmm. like think I have the skill set for. So, but that's scary. That's it's scary yeah. to step into something and be like, this is this feels new in a way. It's like so, a scary jump. Yeah. So to have something that feels less scary because you know how to make this or you feel like you do um, helps. I don't know. Allay some of that fear. I guess. Totally. How do you, um, g- in general, like you're dealing with all three of you are dealing with ish- films with mental health with dealing with death with all these illnesses just like the general complexity of dealing with messy real life so like how do you not go home at the end of the day and just fetal position in the bathroom every day like who what's says the, we don't who says yeah. we don't okay that's therapy. true but i guess yeah therapy <laughs> but like what's a what's a um what's a kind of way to uh to 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 free yourself from some of that like work a day stress of of working on really heavy things Going to therapy. Going to therapy. I mean, I would say uh, this is like an actually, I think that we have a lot of work to do in terms of our service to filmmakers, especially uh, like changing the face of filmmaking, which is my soapbox I'll get on later. But one of the things (laughs) is that, especially in nonfiction, you are bringing people into a lot of space with people with trauma and there's a lot of secondary trauma. And while I think it's really nice that we go to film festivals, we have these spaces where there are panels where you talk about funding or you talk about like, visual storytelling mm-hmm. like we need to have therapy for people going through secondary trauma mm-hmm. which is such a part of documentary right um and just to acknowledge i think also like having a space to acknowledge that like i can't film today because my like 16 year old subject is incarcerated uh, like i can't do this because like so and so's mom was deported or whatever the realities of the situation or like someone has died that and this happens a lot. Like, if you're filming real people, real, the word you can't say happens. And I think that acknowledging right. that it is on a person and that there shouldn't just be a coping mechanism, that it should actually be, like, treated as trauma is mm-hmm. really, really important. And obviously it's not, like, first degree, but it is something we should look at with people who are telling stories because I think it's also, like, sustainable. It's a sustainability question for the people who are really good at it that at a certain point, like, if you re- just receive too much sadness, like, do you stop making the art? Yeah. Wow. Like, I have a therapist, and it's really great. I also really like watching Great British Bake Off, but I don't think yeah. that, like... but like Turning if off the, your brain. Right. right, but if the thing that it's I'm doing right. is, like, drinking right. because I'm sad, is that an appropriate response, or should I be engaging with that and also encouraging other people to have, mm-hmm. like... That's why, like, our texts or our, like, producer therapy that we do is important because it is something my friend, who I was talking about is making a film with the Parkland survivors. Mm -hmm. And so that is a very different conversation to be having than, like, my thing where, like, the kids didn't come to soccer practice Mm -hmm. or the kids didn't come to soccer practice because they're in jail and now we need to, like, I need to produce my way into a jail. So I think (laughs) I'm, like, really belaboring this point, but I think that it's something where, like, It's not about putting it in a box. It's about taking it out of the box to other people and making it a part of, like, the conversation. Mm -hmm. So kind of calling for a different practice as opposed to just 
coping or something like that. Yeah. It's, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Of course. That that makes absolute sense. I will say that like compartmentalization isn't. It's something I have to do within this film, but it's it's not easy. Like you know, uh, I, I, I was when I was filming with my family in North Carolina. My mom's a psychotherapist, just to be transparent, and that comes out in the film. Um, and uh, I was st- staying in the hotel room with her, and her, her family's away, you know, at the house, and we would go there every day. And a lot of uh, trauma and things came up during that time. And um, there was one day where uh, I was just like can't enough like I gotta go and I told my DP it was like it's time to go and she stayed to kind of get this like kind of arc story arc of what was going on at the time and I was just like shaking and livid I was like we have to go like I need to get out of here and in that moment um a I was being producer director but I was also kind of like no one's looking out for me right I was like checking in with my mom and checking in with my family members and my DP like apologized later she's like I'm so sorry I forgot you're also a subject in this and wow, yeah. you know and it was like in that moment I was like oh right <laughs> you know like there, there was just like this kind of um for her she compartmentalized and she was like I'm just focused and I'm a DP and I'm gonna get this and I'm gonna get the shot and I, I appreciate her for that she got some great stuff but at the same time I'm like I'm in the corner mm. and I'm freaking out and it's been like a really crazy day and so like I think what Caitlin's saying is like compartmentalization and putting it in a corner isn't something that we're kind of afforded it's, it's a luxury we're not afforded because we're doing the work and it's so intense and, and it's your life it's your life and even if it's not your personal life story you're also taking this home with you and if you i, I don't know if you you can ever just like leave it right you can't just leave even when the film or the project um is done you, you a lot of that stays with you so i think it's the way in which we talk about how we quote unquote cope and and even changing the language of coping um, because it, it should be it should be something else like there's an experience and to be had and this and transference and it, it doesn't all need to be like thought of as a negative or like a pushing things away right 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 right, right, right yeah. absolutely oh um <laughs> i was just thinking both of your answers are so good i'm give it's just like there's a million things i want to say it gives me so go much for to think it about sure. i'll say a couple of them i mean like uh at the beginning of this project i told myself that like i just kind of made a promise to myself that like it w- and it happened to be January, so I was like, this year, this is the year that I'm really going to think about how my attitude about death. I just kind of, like, told myself that. Wow. I told my therapist that, wrote it in my journal. So I kind of, like, tried to prep myself to just be very open to... Did you know you were gonna you were about to work on Julie? Yeah. Oh, okay. So... I thought it was kind of a coincidence. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> wow. I, I knew I was taking this job. I knew I was going to be working on this project. So I was, like, I kind of just mentally prepared to be, like, ready to like open myself up to going places that maybe I hadn't allowed myself to quite go as deep before. So I like, I tried, tried to get ready. Um, and I think having that mindset, I tried to just stay curious. Um, for the most part when I was in a really sad interview or I was sitting with someone who was crying. Um, I tried to, and, you know, I obviously felt a lot of emotions and empathy during that. Um, but I was also trying to remain curious of, like, what is this bringing up for me? And what is this bringing up for them? And how can we be in this moment together? Um, I don't know. The story that this brought to mind was uh, I had done an interview with uh, some members of Julie's family in California. And I was driving back to my friend's house where I was staying. It was, like, a 45-minute drive. And I listened to, like, this just the saddest album I've ever heard in my life. Uh, which what is, was it? It was um called A Crow Looked at Me by... I listened to that record. Oh, man. Yeah, it's really sad. Yeah, it's, I forget um, the name of the artist. It's Phil Elverum. Right. Who, oh, my God. Uh, Mount Eerie. Oh, my God. Right. Is that yeah. the one after his wife yep. died and left him with a tiny yep. child? Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> Context. Um, <laughs> yep. I'm, like, yep. emotional thinking about it. I mean, I think he describes it as barely music. Yeah. Um, but it's so raw, and the details in it are so incredibly precise that I was listening to it on this 45-minute drive. I pulled up in front of my friend's house like sobbed for like five minutes and then was like okay I have like experienced all the feelings I'm going to feel about that particular experience today like let me go hang out with my friends and I I, I don't necessarily see it as compartmentalization I sort of see that as like 
I'm going to just like feel all these feelings and experience this. And then I'm going to like go do a different thing. It's like a kind of processing. Yeah. Which I feel like Martina's a little bit you were talking about as opposed to being like, cool, let's just move on. Or like, cool, we have to make a movie. Like we have to process some of this stuff. Right. Yeah. There's like no moving on from this. Right. 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 Yeah. Just stays with you. But I I think that's a really great tactic. I'm going to, I'm going to try that and see if that (laughs) works. Crow looked at me. I I don't think I'm going to listen to that. I think that's pretty sad. There's a follow up album too. So I did a, I did a double header back to back. All in one sitting? Yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> and now he's engaged to Michelle Williams. I know, it's really cute. Oh, it's great. It's great. Happy things, things work out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I Let me see if I have one more question here. Um, I do want to ask just in terms of when you finish a project, and I know that like, so in some capacities you're working on long-term, short-term projects, some things that take years, whatever the case might be. Like when you finish something and there's, what was it like finishing julie what was it like finishing obit and what do you look for for the next thing Mm. and martina i want you to answer this too though i know it doesn't pertain to this film as much oh think 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 (laughs) (laughs) it's like you're racing to the finish line and then the moment comes and you're like but wait there's gonna be there's gonna be more right Mm -hmm. there's like a I was asking a, an acquaintance who had just finished a book. I was like, what did you feel when your book came out? Like, what should I prepare for? And he described it as sort of a postpartum period of mm. like, I got kind of depressed and felt like I didn't have anything I was excited to work on. And um, he was like, there's definitely like a mourning period when you finish a project. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that I've totally felt that way. I'm like really glad it's in the world. Um, I feel proud of how it came out and I don't know. I'm, I look back at that moment when I felt like I was in the forest and then I look at the fact that it's like in your podcast feeds right now. And I'm like, still kind of don't know how that happened, but like right on. I don't know. (laughs) That's cool. Um, And then as far as next projects, I don't know, something else that feels as unknowable as this project did, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you're back in the forest with the butter knife. Yeah, but this time I'm like, is it going to be a project that I'm like scared to do? Hell yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Ask me again in six months. Okay, though. we'll check <laughs> in. We'll do this again in six months. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, I have the luxury as a producer, not a director, to have some like intellectual focus on multiple things at once. And I think we're all similar in this way. We're like, I'm working on a lot of stuff yeah. all at once. And the gift of producing is that like, a premiere or anything leading up to a premiere, whether that's a festival or theatrical or broadcast, is a ton of work. So it's not like a drop off. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I would say that like I have staved off any postpartum by like consistently being working on other things and just having more time to work on the other thing because it's not like the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I wonder if there's like, like if there's a last movie and then it's done and then it's just like what else is there question mark like <laughs> i don't i think that because like because at a premiere i have to figure out how like literally every person in the room is going to get to the party and then where after it's done the like print is going to go or like how the press went and did everyone get in there it isn't there's no relief it's like just it's a ramping up mm. and i think that maybe my inclination to be working on other things is so that it never like truly fully ramps down. Like there's no, yeah. 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 I think that makes a lot of sense because I think there is a feeling when you finish something of like, what now? Right. Like that's, maybe that's a postpartum mm-hmm. thing. Or like, what, what did I just do? Like yeah. you just said, I mean, for me, I, you know, working here, I make a lot of short form content yeah. that's on some insane deadline sometimes. Um, and, I used to have this thing of, oh, this this could have been better, and then I'll just stew about how this one piece could have been better, mm. and and now I don't have that luxury of some sorts, you know, to like dwell on it. It's just kind of like, okay, it's out, it's done, and I have to start thinking about the next thing. And it's kind of lovely to have this film um, be my own and be on my own time. And even though I'm gonna finish it next year or whatever next five year five years you, you said it's it probably here. gonna three more years <laughs> like let's just be honest but um you know I, it's like a different pace and it, it doesn't have the same immediacy and so I, I don't ever feel like a i'm never like wanting for something to do 
which is nice, but I think it's the same thing that Eleanor was saying. Is like it's uh, I work better when I have too much on my plate, even though it like people are like, do you want to just take a break? I'm like, no, 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 no. no. there's no breaks. Um, so yeah, I I think I don't know what I can't even really obviously fathom what it looks like. I think I'm in the woods right now. Uh, what it looks like to finish this film or what it would be, mm-hmm. but that's actually kind of the exciting part right now. It's it's uh, I'm really happy that I'm in the thick of it Mm -hmm. and it's unknown and it's great and it's scary and it's traumatizing and it's all the things and gonna just like hack the way through it but um yeah with the short form stuff it's kind of more of like what excites me and what do I want to spend time on and um and other ways of which you're going to be able to tell it right because it's even though there's everything's been done right like every story has been told but you're also bringing your voice to it in a different way as a filmmaker as a, a media maker or whatever have you and then you're telling it from a different angle, so it's always fun to figure out new, exciting ways, I guess, to tell things. Wow, yeah, that's a that's a great way to think about it, and that helps you find energy what to energy? to move on. What energy? <laughs> there's no energy. energy. For like, there's no energy. I don't sleep. Um, we have time for a few questions from the audience, so if you would like to ask a question, please approach the microphone, and you can ask. But don't walk. Yes, walk around the back. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And we'll vamp while folks make it there. That, that, that was good. Yeah. Hey. I only really just realized when you said that. So I made a I've made a lot of television before. I made a lot of movies, and a TV like s- kind of cyclically ends in February, which is right by my birthday. And so I'm always like, I celebrate my birthday, and then I'm for some reason on an airplane, and I feel like that's avoiding the postpartum. And then like Whoa. whenever I come back from whatever it is that I had to do, I'm like, oh, okay, we've eased out of this. Okay, so there's like a natural sort of energy that. The, the, like yeah, life like, happens. Oh, it's like to, a, like, I like only take the first flight out, so it's like I have to wake up at four in the morning to go to the airport. Uh, and it's like no time to worry about I this can't thing. I think being about done. this. <laughs> yeah. Hi. 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 What's your name? Hi. My name is Isis. Isis. What's your question? My question is, um, okay. So initially, I wanted to talk about what it must have been like going into dealing with a person who is about to die and how that might have affected you. And then you spoke about how you actually started planning to be more open um, to that possi- to the, the subject of death and how that affects you in your life and also being present with, your, with the person in the moment um, that you guys were talking um, whenever you guys would meet. And um, my current question is, you know, walking around with feelings from the doc from your documentaries, each of you, um, pressures, um, specifically pertaining to the subject matter, um, and also from your outside lives. Um, I feel that in society we've been trained and taught to cut off your emotions, both positive and negative, because it would be too much of a distraction. Mm. Um, Have you, do you feel like you're getting a hold on being able to, I guess, um, you can really say whatever you want to about that, um, because it's just a a strong focus of mine right now, but also, do you feel that you've been able to carry a little bit of your emotion with you these days opposed to, you know, having to process it or, you know, yeah, opposed to having to process it and then kind of like separate yourself from it to go and into the normal world to have lunch with your friends or to be able to focus enough to work on your documentary and any other work you might be um, engaging in? Thank you. What a beautiful yeah, question. A question. Yeah. Thank, you Thank you for you asking for that. that. Um, when you were speaking, the thing that came to mind for me was, um, and I think I've been thinking about this a lot this year, we as uh, people that do what we do are constantly asking people to be open and vulnerable for us. So I've been trying to take a cue from the question, what I'm asking of other people and sort of bring my own honesty and vulnerability to that. Um, so that is sort of a, an exchange that I think I've been thinking a lot about. And when I'm more vulnerable, um, I find that I am able to connect more with people. Cool. Yeah, that's yeah. just a yeah, really beautiful. Yeah, we that's all, just really us, beautiful. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Nope, that's gorgeous. That's Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, Hi. And oops, 
And uh, <clears throat> Eleanor, this is specifically for you. Um, so death is a thing that we're all going to have to do eventually. So it's a very personal thing. Um, and in doing anything you want, we w creators want to prepare. And you prepared by saying at the start of the year, this is the time that I'm going to be open to this thing that happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what was the takeaway? Um, how did Julie help you reckon with something that we all have to go through? Mm. Um, whew, this, that, again, such an amazing uh, question, something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I think the whole, I think the message that Julie wanted to leave people with, um, I shouldn't say I think I know, because she said this a lot in conversation and she writes beautifully about this in her book, is she wants she you know her her exhortation i guess is is a word um you could use for it is to basically like think about knowing that you are gonna die we all are thinking about how you want to live your life and making choices intentionally um was you know if you could say like there was something that she learned through by going through this experience it was that it was that um I know I'm going to die, so I'm going to be really intentional with the choices I make. And if I'm holding back for fear or something, it's like, why? Because, you know, one day my death will come. Um, so I guess that's something I've been thinking about a lot, too. I've been trying to make choices in my own life that uh, are the way I want to be living, um, which is why I actually find her story really hopeful and I find her book really hopeful because it... Uh, it's kind of a plea to just, I don't know, say, uh, F it and just, uh, do what feels right and important to you. Um, so I don't know. I guess that, that has been like a big, a big takeaway, I think. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Hi, Alice. Hey. <laughs> I'm Alice. Um, hi, Alice. Hi, so, Alice. hi. Going off of the, um, uh, feeling of looking back at a project and feeling that it wasn't good enough. Um, I recently um, realized that I find it very hard to um, accept and believe pr any praise or, you know, maybe an award or something like that. Um, feel proud, like truly proud. But I'm working on it. But, um, um, and I feel like that and what what helped me work on it was realizing that that will only hold me back from truly doing things that I'm absolutely proud of, like that stifled feeling. Um, do you guys have any advice on like how to feel comfortable with you know being realistic but also being proud? I'm totally auditioning a thought here, but it's been something I've been thinking about with this, with the idea of like being in the woods with your various weapons. Um, there's a director I worked with who's a, who's also a genius, uh, who said that there's a like 60, 40 ratio with that she wants to have doing work that she should feel like 60 for 60% 60 terrified of what she's doing creatively and 40% comfortable. And that way, if she fails, she's at least failed with gaining experience and growth. Um, and I think that that's part of it. And I don't know how much it plays into the pride, but the pride can maybe not necessarily be tied to the success of the piece or your, or sort of the validation that you receive from that, but more to like the process and the growth, um, which also just removes it from a lot of outside metrics. Because the thing is that like, there are metrics and we all impose them on our own work um, and everyone who's at every level is looking at those same metrics and also sort of more granularly at the littler ones. Um, so like my friend whose movies at Sundance is sad it's not at Cannes. My friend whose movies at Tribeca is sad that it's not at Sundance. And you can do that forever if you're nominated for an indie spirit. You're sad it's not an Oscar. If it's not an Oscar, you're sad it's not a Pulitzer. Like, there's just an endless cycle of this. And so the pride and the growth in the process is also, like, that's sort of the place where you can actually just do it as, like, internal. I don't know, like, that's mm -hmm. all very easy to say. Mm -hmm. But it's just moving away from like really something external to something that can be internal that mm -hmm. like if you don't, you know, 
if you don't doubt for 20 minutes whether you should apply for something and it's only 15, then that's still growth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well said. I love that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see if I can do it ever. <laughs> Same. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Hi, Zoe. Hi. How's it going? Good, how are Good. you? Um, my question is, how do you draw the line between sacrificing your personal needs and personal, personal schedule and getting the shot when you feel like absolutely indebted to a subject who has given you very precious access? Yeah, I struggled with that a lot in the beginning uh, because of the subject matter and also my health, like uh, I was trying to you know straddle the two um and i just really thought it intentionally about the days that i needed to be there and the days that i didn't serve somebody by being half there and if i was tired and i needed to like just stay home rest and eat and just watch netflix like that's what i needed to do on that day because i i have done those days where i've just pushed myself and, like this needs to get done and then the, the footage isn't there because i'm not present because i'm i'm a half a person and so i think um the term self-care is, you know, a cliche, but it's there for a reason. It, you really need to be kind of like present and one within yourself first to be able to do the work. Otherwise, you're not a service to anyone else. And hopefully you've given yourself enough of um, like communication with it, with your subjects that they kind of understand that. And with my subject matter, it was kind of most days I'm like, I'm feeling one of these days. And they're like, Got it. And some days they would have the same thing. Um, so you kind of need to be there. You need to be a human as much as you are like the producer, director behind the camera um, on, on the same front. I mean, otherwise you burn yourself out and it's it's not it's not a good look, honestly. So, yeah. And no one knows what you don't have. And this is so people only know what's in the project. Mm -hmm. They don't know what you don't have. The first feature that. I produced lost six cards, which is like 12 hours of footage in the first two weeks. And um, they basically, they were like, well, we should just stop making the movie because we lost everything. And the, there's a movie. And no one there is like, but I heard that once they went to an ice cream parlor and talked about their feelings. Like, no one can see that. They only see what you put in the movie. And so there are, there will be instances where something really pivotal will happen in the situation depending on how you're filming that you can't be there for and like it's a shame but then you find a creative solution yeah wow yeah i had a similar situation with uh, our show where we felt like there was so much tape so many interview moments that we didn't get to have with julie before she died and up until the second to last draft there was like almost like an apology of sorts in the intro or one of the early where I sort of introduced what the show is that was like, well, we tried to do this, but we instead did this. And then um, my editor was like, why are you apologizing? You get to set the expectations for your piece. So just like put what's in there and, and that's, that's going to be it. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. This has been amazing. It's Thank you fun. so Thank much. You. Thank you, it's been great. We could talk um, for hours. Yeah. Want, yeah. Let's, let's just keep going. No, uh, before we wrap up, is any projects you want to tell us about? Any pitches you want to give us? Anything that you'd like to let us know about that we should know about? Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> We're like, um, I do. I have a directly relevant thing. So I work for Tribeca Film Institute, which is the nonprofit arm of the whole Tribeca Film Universe. And I run a program called If Then Shorts, and we focus on regional storytelling of documentary shorts. We have we do that through a pitch. We then give the winner of the pitch, we invite five to seven projects um, to pitch live at a partner film festival. And then the winner of that pitch gets $25,000 to make their film mm -hmm. and mentorship and some distribution consultation. Um, we are opening one of those this summer for Doc NYC, which will be stories of the American Northeast, which is focusing on storytellers based in this region and stories based in this region. So if you are working on a documentary that is short, that you can loosely make for around $25,000, loosely in six months, um, I encourage you to apply. It's really... Uh, the effort of the program is to amplify diverse voices and work a lot with emerging filmmakers and really actively change the shape of nonfiction cinema. So please go to our website, which is tfiny.org, 
and keep an eye out because I'm very excited to read all of your applications. There are people in this room that have to apply. They know who they are. <laughs> That cool. sounds so rad. Yeah. Yeah. And if and if like you do apply and you don't get in, or if it's just of interest, then like come watch the pitch because I feel like that's a cool documentary thing that we don't like. Yeah, we aren't usually allowed in the room to watch how people talk about their projects, and I think it's super informative about how we talk about our own work. Yes. So that will be at Doc NYC, which is in New York City, right? In the fall. In the fall. <laughs> cool. And we'll send a we'll get a link and I'll post it on the web. We'll get it posted on the website again in case you forget. Um, unless there's anything else, we will call this thing. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll be right back. Oh, I like so much I have my Oh, I have so Oh, guys, you look different from this picture, okay? <laughs> totally different. Yeah, I know. It's so good. Yeah, 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 ye